Hi now. Hey, Stuart. Sorry, I'm just trying to get my video. To, there there you is. are. Um, I've not seen you since you got the finished book. I'm a bit nervous. Yeah. Did, did you like it? Yeah, yeah, it's great. It looks fantastic. Because it was here, but I couldn't get at it till I got out of isolation. Oh, God. So, so you like, wanted to bring it up. I said, I don't want to, you know, kind of put germs on it and stuff like that. So, uh, Oh, it looks amazing. It really does. Well done. And thank you for all the time and effort and, and everything gone into it. Well, I mean, likewise. for a for a first book, you know, that we've kind of been behind. Um, like I know it was your project more so, but it just it's something to be really proud of, you know. Um, because you're always trying to kind of have a certain quality of things you do that it's not, you know, like you see a lot of kind of cheaply done crappy stuff like out there from yeah. people and a lot of it is usually nothing to do with the band you know mm. um but this is something to be proud of and and even before i got to see it over being locked away loads of people had seen it and got theirs and everybody was just raving about it so it's been it's been a win-win all around it must be strange to see your whole career mapped out mm. like that from a to z well certainly that phase, the cranberries phase of your career. Yeah. yeah, it is really weird. Like honestly, it's like it almost feels like it's different people. Mm. You know, I it doesn't when I look at it, I feel like those four kids are not us. I know I don't know how that sounds, but it's like it's so long ago it feels. Um mm. and I look, I guess in many ways I'm always saying, Oh, it doesn't feel like that on go, but it's really hard to explain. So much has happened that it makes it feel further than it is. I totally you know? understand. I mean, for yeah. me even. I I'm just glad those early Limerick Tribune reviews were, were positive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, not there going, I'm sorry about yeah. that first demo review, no? <laughs> no, no. I mean, because I, look, I, like, look I, obviously I haven't read it from front to back because there's a whole lot of reading, but I've kind of gone through and then you go back to it again and you read a different page and it was interesting to read like Michael Stipe's stuff and Melody stuff, you know, um, because I was interested to get their take in it, it being so long ago as well. Mm. And it was their point of view the same as ours. Because we were just like, and I think they both kind of say in their, you know, in their pieces that we were so kind of eager kids, kind of ready to go, full of beans, you know, <laughs> first time in America, you know, we'd all grown up listening to R.E.M. And, and then kind of, so you're on that tour as well. And, and it's just, it's just, it's one big kind of continuous bit of excitement. And it's always something new. It's one of the things I think anyone who does this job would love, is loves that part in that it's never the same thing every day. There's always something different. It was great. Melody had a, a scrabble around in her big box and found a load mm -hmm. of photos she'd not seen in 20 or 30 years. Um, Michael was telling me the story, and I wish we'd got the photograph. There is one, but he couldn't find it. He says of him wearing Dolores's rubber mm. skirt with spikes. Did, yeah. did you witness that? I did. I think half of the canteen did. It was uh, it was in catering, and it disappeared. And then they came <laughs> back, and he was wearing that. And the shocking thing was, <laughs> she was quite thin at the time. Mm. He was able to fit into it, you know. <laughs> It was interesting because it can be hard sometimes to get superstars to do things when they're not doing promo. I got on yeah. to R.E.M.'s manager, Burtis Downs. And I'm not lying. 90 seconds later, he sent me a mail back saying, Michael will do it. I don't have yeah. to ask him. He loved That's the cranberries. So cool. I'm going to yeah. embarrass you now because Michael says, I speak on behalf of Peter, Mike and Bill too. When I say Dolores and the guys brought us great joy. No, oh, That's cool. It's like... Stuff like that, I mean, you have to kind of put yourself in a position where I remember those early tours and we were in the van um, and we were going through this big REM stage. So we became fanatical about them. And this is like kind of around the time of document. And, you know, it was kind of pre-Warner kind of when they mm. went, became really big and, and we were listening to loads of that. And then when you end up on a tour with them is one thing. But then all these years later for them to even remember us, you know, you're kind of pinching yourself still to this day that, you know, your idols know who you are and, and know, you know, what you've done. That kind of thing is just, um, 
it's a real kind of, it's a buzz, I guess, is the easiest way to explain it. Yeah, because Michael says that he made a mental note to check you out, having met you doing the Linger shoot, hmm. like what he heard, and then took you out on tour because he wants to watch you every night. That was his yes. vested interest. He wanted to see a band he loved from the side of the stage. Um, we, we put out a call for photographs from fans and, and amateur photographers, and we got, uh, I mean, it, it's a, a treasure trove. Um, I, I think my favourite one is a, from a guy called Jim Leatherman. I mean, do you even remember July 1993 playing Einstein a go-go in Jacksonville? Yeah, we remember it well. So the, the short version of that story, they gave us T-shirts that night, but Mike wore that T-shirt till it basically fell apart for years, right? And that's how we always remember the gig. Like, Farag and mine, you know, probably lost it in a month or two. But the Einstein Gogo, we always said should have ended up in a hard rock cafe because it was on a dummy. Because he just, <laughs> there must be hundreds of photos with him wearing that T-shirt. And we always remember the gig because uh, of, and, and it's such an unusual name for a venue. But I remember we, we did the gig. It was a small club. And um, we were, it was our first tour. We were kind of hanging around afterwards. And then loads of kids that were the same age as us that live locally started coming up and we we sat outside on the street for hours afterwards with those kids just chatting away and like we were still nobody kind of knew we we you know we were starting to get a name but mm. we weren't that well known and uh it's funny like a night like that i remember better than i would something that happened you know when you were playing an arena years later where it was just kind of you know do the gig get in the van and leave kind of thing whereas they're the things that are the kind of really cool memories. So I definitely remember that. that I suppose it was so shiny and new. Now, now, the photograph that Jim sent in, and it's genius, it's Dolores. Now, that there's water pouring off the walls. It looks like someone's thrown a bucket of water over Dolores because she's sweating. She's got Doc Martens on. Mm -hmm. Don't think there's any socks. A pair of almost kind of hot pants, shorts. A, a Metallica Guns N' Roses combo sweatshirt. And she's Irish dancing. And that, to me, yeah. is Dolores. Yeah, and I mean, Irish dancing on one of the smallest stages you'll ever see. So there is not much room for, you know, it's it's got to be very still and there's guitars swinging around and, and you know, there's gear everywhere. Um, and, and she did that a lot. I mean, it didn't matter what size the venue was. She gave it as much, if it was to 50 people, as to 50,000 people. Mm. Simon Le Bon made the point that she very quickly learned how to reach out to row ZZZ. And he speaks very fondly of the time you went out on tour with Duran Duran. The crowd wouldn't have known who you were, mm. but you saw it as an opportunity. You gave it socks. And he was saying by the end of the tour, they were getting a wee bit worried because you were getting just as good a response as they were. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was such a weird one for us because I guess at the time we would have still been considered, you know, kind of indie guitar band where well, we always looked at ourselves as that and Duran Duran were in our eyes more pop and uh, we had just we literally came off the suede tour and the next tour was the Duran Duran tour and it was night and day because we played clubs mainly with on the suede tour or theaters even and um, then we were playing arenas with them it was definitely the first proper professional tour you know, a big tour, big, big stage. We had to learn how to, like, you know, kind of negotiate that whole thing. And, um, yeah, it was like like that. Like, Mike was a huge Duran Duran fan of the 80s. <laughs> Sweet <laughs> boots, the whole he never lot. told me that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he keeps that one quiet, but he <laughs> had the whole look down. And, uh, you know, he was just kind of, he couldn't believe it. Now, he kind of, you know, grown out of it slightly at that point. But he was still, you know, I mean, we were all were kind of, you are starstruck because there's these guys that, you know, were on top of the pops when we were kids are now mm. down. And they used to come up to talking to you. They were really normal. This is the one thing we always found. The bigger the band, the more normal. It's the often the way. Were mo most of the time. I know it was all the, you know, exceptions. But, you know, you, you know, there's that kind of thing. Everyone thinks, oh, big bands are kind of, you know, kind of, up their own arse kind of thing. And uh, we've been lucky. We've never really had that experience. And they were great. They were, you know, and I know Simon and Dolores really clicked and they did 
few things later on, you know, um, together uh, for the Pope and things like that. So, I mean, yeah, again, it's another pinch yourself moment. Um, you know, but then I remember we left that tour. We were back playing clubs again, like, you know, a couple of weeks later. <laughs> Pet house so this, pavement. Yeah, this is it. Yeah, yeah. I, I know you weren't there that night, but Simon tells the story of the big Pavarotti gig in, in Modena in Italy. And uh, afterwards, Princess Diana was there and nobody was going up to her, apart from, guess who? Dolores. Yeah. How are you? Yeah. I got like a house on fire. She just had that ability to click with people, didn't she? Yeah, it was like, technically, I don't think there's any filter. <laughs> it was just, there's someone, I'm going to talk to them. But Dolores, I mean, genuinely didn't care about the whole celebrity thing. And I mean, it wasn't even as bad then as it is now. But she just didn't recognize that. It was like, that's just somebody over there. You know, I'm going to go over and start talking to them. I recognized her face and that was it. And I saw her do that like a, a million times. And, um, you know, then she'd come back. Sometimes you go, you know, your man's a bit of an arse or whoever, like, you know, <laughs> whoever it might be. Thankfully, not that often, you know, but then she could disappear. And a few hours later, you look over and she's in the middle of that entourage over there mm. laughing and joking. So, I mean, it's, um, look, she had that gift that she just, I mean, the, you know, as we say here, the gift of the gab. Yeah. Like she had it in bucketfuls. Yeah. Um, I described the other day in an interview the first third of the book almost as a love letter to Limerick. I, I was a blow in, but I fell in love with the city. And Kevin Barry writes a beautiful piece just, and, and you can smell Limerick from the 1980s and the 1990s. Um, I remember 1993, the Cranberries mania when you came home and played the Theatre Royal. That must have been a very special game. We got some lovely photographs of you at Shannon and then in the Theatre Royal. Mm. That I guess that was like probably one of the, our favourite gigs even to this day because um, we were known around town and then, you know, we left and we were gone for a long time and we came back and, uh, you know, you came back to that and it was just amazing um, to, because it, any band will tell you there's not tonight playing your hometown. I mean, nerves are worse than ever. Mm. You know, you're you're kind of you just worry more. And then there's this thing of trying to kind of, I guess you're going, look, I've done it. I've, you know, I've arrived, if you want to call it that. Um, but it was just amazing. Like I don't know if anyone could even hear us. It was so loud in the place. It was just incredible because we had played that venue. I'm not sure. I'm guessing a year or a year and a bit before that. And we did okay. It was fine. You know, we, we, you know, we had a good crowd. But in that year or whatever it was before, you know, that passed by and then we did the next show. It was absolute mayhem. I can remember like the back door where we got in, like just people banging, banging. Oh, I'm your cousin. I'm, <laughs> you know, I was like, <laughs> suddenly we'd all, all of us had all these cousins and guys we went to school with that we hadn't seen. And going, did I go to school with that guy? You know, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, yeah. And I mean, we were uh, we were so nervous playing that show until you kind of get into it, and yeah. then you know you realise it's kind of they're on your side. It's no yes. one's here to you know no one's here to catch out. It's kind of <laughs> this is it, and um, yeah, it was just absolutely amazing. Um, and the weird thing was, you know, we did that, and we kind of hung around for we didn't hang around for that long because it was so crazy, and we had had a, a kind of a crazy year as it was. Mm. Um, and then it was like, I remember for me, I came out, I couldn't get a cab. I had to walk home to my parents' house and back into my bedroom at home after all of that. The glamour, you know, yes. Yeah, it was like, there you go, crawling into your single bed at home again. And um, yeah, back in your bedroom that you grew up in. For me, it was lovely talking to some of the people who were there at the start and, and, and the end. And it's a great interview with Stephen Street, who's a fascinating man, very insightful about the chemistry in the band. He made the point that, it had to be the four of you. If one component had gone, it wouldn't have been the Cranberries. Uh, he, again, dug into his archives. Those photographs of recording in the studio, again, must be very evocative for you. Yeah. He sent those um, to me a couple of years ago. And um, he just came by them. The girl that worked in the studio, he was working on another job. And she was like, oh, I, I met you before. I've got all these photos. This total weird coincidence. Um, so I had those on my laptop there for a while. 
Um, but again, you're looking at it, you're going like, Christ, that doesn't even look like me. I mean, I, I look like, at the time, there's one there, it's in the book, Stephen and I are sitting on the chair together, going through whatever. And like, I thought I knew everything. I thought I knew the world. I mean, I, I barely left Ireland at that point. That was doing the first album. Yeah. So I had probably left Ireland twice to go to London to do with work, uh, you know, and, and very naive. But still, you you mean, you think that you know everything, as, as every 20-year-old does or whatever it was around that time. But, I mean, Stephen, I have to say, like, we have so much to be grateful for, for Stephen because mm. we... We took a chance and asked him, to, you know, you know, we've said it many times, didn't think he'd do it, but he took the chance on us. And I mean, he walked into this. We were very tight, the four of us had our own in jokes and he was thrown in the middle of that. Um, but was patient with us. There was a lot we didn't know. Pushed us to the point that he knew, OK, we've reached as far as we can go with this. And that has as much to do with creating the sound of the cranberries as the four of us did, mm. you know, and, um, it, you know, he, again, something we've said a hundred times is like the fifth member of the band. Yeah. And, and it was great to develop that relationship with him over the 30 years, you know, mm. even though we did a couple of albums without him, we still ended up kind of boomeranging back to him every time. And, um, I mean, we might not see each other for years and you walk into the studio, plug in, and it's like we only did it two weeks ago. It just clicked again with him. And he, I think he got the band more than anybody else. He knew, you know, leave a space there. That's for vocals. You need more guitar there. He, you know, he knew exactly what needed where. And, um, you know, I'll always be grateful to him for that. He describes you actually as brothers. It's very sweet. But I was almost there in the studio with you because he's just the detail. It, it, he described mm. it so beautifully. It'll give you a real insight into yeah. how you guys were, were, were working then and, and, of course, with the last album. Andy Earl, a photographer who's with you from mm. start to finish, uh, told us where the sofa came from. I've never asked you, and I've meant to, what is your favourite Cranberries album cover? I think um, probably the first one. Yeah. Yeah. The first or the second one for me, I think, because um, I remember having a talk with, with Callie, who was the art director, and I had seen um, with the Beatles, that album cover, where the light, you know, the shade only kind of, the light hits one side of their face. And I had said to him, you know, I loved that and ah. thought it looked really cool, you know. Mm. And, uh, and then that conversation developed over time and everybody kind of got their bit into it. And suddenly when we have that album cover, which is very, you know, it's a black album cover with the light is exactly doing that. It's kind of, it's hitting us almost on one side where half of us aren't even looking at the camera, you know? And I remember there was a guy in Ireland, Toby was his name. I can't remember his second name. And we showed him the cover, <laughs> what we picked. They were like, oh, black album covers don't sell. That's that's a bad idea, you right. know. <laughs> yeah. So, which you know, telling four kind of angry teenagers or just past that is a red flag. When yeah, we're definitely using it. Then you know, it's kind of and uh, I don't know where that guy ever ended up, but it obviously did pretty okay with the black album cover. Yeah, you, you dug your heels in. Um, yeah. Dolores's mother, who is a force of nature, wonderful woman, uh, Eileen, says that. Um, Dolores is gone, but she's not really because music is still around. Mm. And I know that she takes great comfort uh, from the fact that the Cranberries are still influencing people. We saw Irish Women in Harmony, um, 36 yeah. of them who are all interviewed in the book. Uh, we talked about uh, Miley Cyrus. There are still 13 and 14 year old kids in their bedrooms making music because of you and Dolores. Um, it's incredible. Yeah, I mean, I'm shocked. I mean, I'm. I, I was that kid in a bedroom because I heard the Smiths or New Order or whomever trying to do my version of them, never thinking that, you know, you'd yeah. pass on that down the road. And, and it's, it's very surreal to think that that, that happens. Um, and it is only since the doors passed away because I kind of, I guess it put a kind of a full stop to the end of it all. And then 
you start to hear these stories more and you start to take it in. And it's only in those few years, I guess, that um, we've kind of realized that there has been that influence on people. Because when you're in the middle of it, you're just thinking, like as most musicians, you're quite selfish and think, I'm just going to write the best song for me and I'm going to do, you know, the best I can do. You're not thinking that there's going to be a million people listening to this at some point. Mm. I, I, I look, you're better off not thinking that anyway, because yeah. I, I mean, you're just never going to leave the house if you do that. So I, it's just, um, it's, it's amazing. It is. And Dolores would be absolutely over the moon because like the rest of us, she grew up listening to, you know, the likes of like Dolores's music. This was far bigger than the rest of us mm. because she was into, you know, religious music. Yep. traditional Irish music and then more you know like Sinead O'Connor the Smiths all that yeah. kind of stuff that we all grew up listening to so and and you can hear that in her vocal the combination of all of these elements brought together um so I mean it'll be interesting to see if at some point a band is the next kind of you know evolution of the cranberry so it would be or what it would sound like because I find there is always a kind of a next generation yeah, there's a slight twist on what that band did before. I think the intergenerational thing is fascinating, and uh, we talked to Andy Rourke at some length in New York, and of course he was in a band, a side project with Dolores Dark, along with her boyfriend Ollie, and he's worked with one or two decent singers in his time, has Andy, and he said that yeah. Dolores definitely right up there at the very top. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm not surprised. I mean, she just. It was real natural to the point that you'd be jealous, you know, you're kind of, she'd come in and go, mm -mm, and you go, maybe do it double that or whatever. And you're thinking, why didn't I think of that? You know, kind of thing. She just, she had a natural talent and then, you know, there's no learning that no. you're born with it. And that yeah. is as simple as that. That's a lovely place, I think, to wish you a very, very Christmas and happy new year. I must just say it's been an absolute honor for me to have been on the Cranberries journey with you and to have documented it. And uh, yeah, thank you for all the great music and the friendship down through the years. It's been fantastic. Oh, thank you as well, Stuart. Like, honestly, thanks for everything. It, it it looks amazing, you know, and I'm sure you're happy in one way to see the back of it as well. You might <laughs> be by now. It was my I version mean, of you doing the Woodstock soundtrack. Yeah, it was kind yeah, of like it's never ending. Yeah, because it was a long road for you, you know, you were at it quite some time. And you must have been lying in bed some nights going, like seeing our heads in your sleep almost. Because oh, I know the way these things can, can go on and on. And oh uh, yeah, you know, so look, thank you for everything. And um, look, hopefully we get to do something again at some right. point. We'll catch you in the new year. You take care, mate. Okay. Thanks, Cheers. George. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.